Yeah, I mean, at this point, you're going to get him to just develop bad habits mm-hmm. and get used to them. And you're, you're just going to sit here and destroy another quarterback. I mean, you are. And, and, you know, part of the conversation of who to get as offensive coordinator during the offseason, me and David were saying, okay, well, a guy like Cliff Kingsbury is out there. But you won't make that move because he has had coaching experience. It now threatens your position. If you get into a part of the season where you're not doing well and your head's on the chopping block, guess what? There's a guy behind you that can obviously take your place. However, as a head coach, that shouldn't be your thought process or your concern. It should be, let's get every damn good experienced coach in here to make this thing work and work right. The best teams, like, uh, you know, you could point to the Chiefs. Andy Reid's in charge of the offense. Their defensive coordinator was a head coach. I mean, the guy's experienced. He's good. Knows what he's doing. You know what I mean? And so you just, you can't sit there and let fear and desperation dictate the personnel moves you make like that. And, and yeah, I I just, it, it sucks constantly trying this, like, next up and coming thing, trying to make names out of guys. Meanwhile, you as a head coach aren't even established. Like you're trying to create what a coaching tree out of nowhere. Uh, Meanwhile, you've done nothing yourself. And I I don't know, it kind of drives me nuts. And at the same time, it's like, we look at what the potential future candidates are. And so like the only experimental guy I would want or even entertain would be Ben Johnson. Just because it might be like a Kyle Shanahan situation where when he left the Falcons, he took all the success really with him because you you just saw that this guy's a good coach. But even that scares me a little bit because it's still an experimental thing. Like I would – I'm so tempted to just be like, dude, just go get a guy that's that's done it, even like a Mike Vrabel or somebody out there that, that can bring in a staff here with him. But the guy that should have been Jim Harbaugh last year, it really should have. Yeah, I, I think when I look at like the coaching candidates, it's like, yeah, Ben Johnson, but not I, I do not want another defensive person um, like because exactly what you talked about, Paul, a lot of them, you can get these like old defensive coordinators. Well, that's what's going to happen to Eberflus after he's gone. Someone's going to have Eberflus as their D.C. for for however long. And you see that like Vic Fangio right after he had his shot at head coach. Uh, Staley, same thing where these good defensive guys get one shot, then they're done. Then after that, um, the other thing too is like Ben Johnson, when I was going through offensive coordinators, like who could the Bears get? The thing that really stuck out to me is when you look at play calling EPA, right? What play callers give you a better chance to win? They're all the top 10 are head coaches besides Ben Johnson. And who was like one of the only offensive coordinators that was going to get an offensive coordinator job was, um, I was going to say Luke Getze was Shane Waldron because they don't become available for offensive coordinator because they go to head coaches. And so that's where like, I, that's where I also like the idea of, of just firing them so that, you know, it's not going to get a, you don't get a head start on anything, but it's nice for like a Ben Johnson just to be like, okay, it's available. It's it's there. They officially moved on. So yeah, I don't know your take, Dave. No, David, you brought that exact point up to me before. Which part? That you almost have to have an offensive guy as your head coach because right. if you're a defensive guy, they're gonna explain always, that whole process. Yeah. Well, that's that's just kind of one of those things that I'm sure Brad understands already in the last like 10 years that the majority of the successful NFL head coaches have to be uh offensive play callers and or offensive coordinators because if you have a defensive minded head coach and they are incredibly successful on offense, more than likely within two to three years of their success, they're going to be poached by some other team as the new head coach for them. So then you turn into this revolving door of, well, you can leave, but don't take too much of your staff with you because we want to do some, we want to maintain some consistency here, which is unrealistic. The NFL, the new head coach is going to take most of his staff with him. And then you're stuck holding the bag with this defensive guy and hoping that you can hire a new offensive coordinator. And that's what you see with player with teams like, I don't know, like the Steelers, for even example, where, you know, they're they're hiring this guy and then they're firing this guy, Matt Canada. Now they're hoping that Arthur Smith can have a new career revival kind of thing. And it's it works. It's fine. But you're never going to see anything innovative. You're never going to see anything creative or revolutionary, especially when you have like young quarterbacks that you can kind of pair up with them and start figuring these kind of new and interesting things out. The Steelers is a good point just because I know Tomlin typically comes up as like the morale head coach and stuff like that. But to your point, it's like, yeah, the offense has been like something that 
the Steelers fans have hated. It holds them back years. for years. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like the thing that holds them back. I'm curious about the Lions too. It's like everybody's like, well, we need like a Dan Campbell. It's like there's only one Dan Campbell. And also, I'm really curious to see what happens to the Lions next year without Ben Johnson. Because everything points to Ben Johnson being this unbelievable offensive mind. Now there's more to being a head coach than just being an offensive mind. But I, I love the idea of him potentially being here. But yeah, it's like you can't just it, to bank on that would be difficult. But to your point, Paul, Harbaugh was right there for the taking. But yeah, he's too alpha. He's too aggressive for the McCaskies. And that's kind of where even uh, I, Brad, even uh, uh, sorry, Brad Johnson, Brad Johnson scares me sometimes where he already kind of had that recent press conference quote that went viral where he's going like, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to continue to call plays. Right. And that that's a good thing, I suppose, but it can also be kind of a negative thing. Right. Because if you're too preoccupied, then you do need to you need to pair Brad Johnson with like Robert Sala or Mike Vrabel yeah, yeah. or somebody. And you need to be comfortable enough with having these alpha guys walk in this room, each be responsible, but also respectful for their own you know situations and and their own, uh, you know, responsibilities and things like that. So. Yeah, it's that's why Brad Johnson scares me because ben you don't Johnson. know. Ben, I'm sorry, I keep seeing looking at Brad and I see <laughs> Brad Johnson. Um, uh, Ben Johnson scares me because yeah, there's a very distinct possibility he could be the next Matt Nagy where he is this offensive coordinator. I'm sorry, like you take an untal under talented roster. One of the things that is carrying Detroit over the hump and allows Ben Johnson to do all these ridiculously cool things is because they're absurdly talented. And they can do, uh, you know, uh, double pass reverses with linemen that have been there and established for two years. You can't bring that in and do this next year. You can't bring that over here and just start fixing that. I don't care how many linemen you draft or how many free agents you sign or how many, you know, uh, quarterbacks, coaches you turn into your offensive coordinators. You can't be, come in here and expect that to work. You need to have a fundamental understanding of establishing an identity of what to do with this culture, what this team's complementary football style is going to be. Uh, see what talent you have, what things you need to change. And you can't do that overnight, even if you are Ben Johnson and you are immensely intelligent on the offensive side. And for those that are watching on YouTube, you probably saw my eyes going all over the place because I had to pull up this quote because, Dave, you reminded me of this where Kevin Fishbane from The Athletic tweeted this out where um, uh, Sando from the NFL, he put together a New York Times article where um, just basically saying that about the Bears where – the GM won't want to fire the coach unless the president is on board with that and the president is not going to turn the reins over to a proven coach. And then execs around the league think a Bears structure featuring an empowerment engaged team president Kevin Warren all but rules out the possibility Chicago would seek established power coaches. So kind of goes to that whole thing of like, because they're saying that executives think because of Kevin Warren and just how the bears are that they wouldn't go after one of these powerful coaches, like the, the dominant voices in the room, but it's like, yeah, it, you, you can't just have all these soft-spoken people. Like I always thought that Matt Eberflus looked like a preacher, um, that you would have, or just kind of this, this laid back dude, but yeah, it, so, it's frustrating. You know, <laughs> this I is a, Sorry, Paul, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I, I want to say one more thing about Matt Eberflus. David, I'll let you respond. And then we'll go up to the next level and talk about Ryan Poles because I like how we're actually just going through from bottom to top. And I know Dave's got a lot to say about the very top too. So with Matt Eberflus, it's interesting. Do you, so we kind of went back and forth on this, me and David, and I had to look it up because um, Ryan Poles was hired. And then two days later, he hired Matt Eberflus. However, when he was hired, he was able to interview the second round of candidates, meaning the first round of candidates had already been kind of sifted through. And those three guys were Matt Eberflus, Dan Quinn. Man, I forget the last one. Uh, defense uh, coordinator, Baltimore Ravens. Uh, Mike McDaniel? No. no, Mike Michael something though. Um, no, it's a old, old older, soft spoken guy. Uh, polls head coaching interviews. Yeah, um, so it, it's just funny because you know, so he got to choose between those three guys, and um, and essentially picked Matt Eberflus, right? However, what the, what they were saying is Matt Eberflus, Jim Caldwell, Jim Caldwell. Oh, there yeah. you go. Matt Eberflus, and I remember at that time actually wanting Dan Quinn, 
due to the experience. I was like, he's not the best guy out there. He's been in a Super Bowl, though. Like, just get me the guy that kind of just knows what he's doing. But that's another topic, right? So, Matt Eberflus, though, I believe the Colts were about to fire him. I don't think he was about to get retained by the Colts. He's about to just be let go for anybody to be able to, you know, take him as a defensive coordinator or whatever. And here we are giving him a promotion. That sounds eerily similar to a Waldron situation, doesn't it? Pretty much. So, like, you're kind of seeing that same thing repeat. Yeah, I'm trying to remember who, because I I heard that from, um, it's from the, like, I listened to the Bet the Board podcast. It's Pain Insider and uh, I forgot the other the other person, but they're very plugged in people. They actually were the ones that brought up um, Chris Jones, like, polls calling for Chris Jones uh, during the up. trade deadline. But, yeah, they said they had very plugged in people that in the Colts organization that were saying, yeah, Flus was going to be fired. Instead, the Bears were like, yeah, we want him as head coach. And they're like, okay, uh, yeah. Here you go. Here you go. You can talk to him. So, yeah. And so that just kind of, you know, now, uh, David, did you want to speak on the coaching level anymore? Or you want to take a step um, up to the GM? I know you had I just think kind of I do have, I do have in terms of, in terms of, and this can, this can be brought up right after polls conversation or even at the top of this, but I had a good, I had a question for you guys in terms of like, it, the percentages of blame to kind of pass around here. Right. And in my mind, it's like the percent, if there's a hundred percent chunk, right. Maybe this isn't Paul, you rolled your eyes. Maybe this isn't a fun. No, no, me, it's, like, it's interesting. I like it because but like to me, the players get five to 10 and David, and you know, usually I blame the players the most. And that's yeah. why I kind of shook my head. Cause it's like, man, this is totally against what I'm usually about. It, 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 it when it, you initially asked it, I was like, Oh man, I usually want to blame the players the most. Yeah, for me, it's so the players get can't. five to ten, and then part of me is like, well, I want to blame Waldron a lot, but part of me also just sees the similarities between just the just disjointed nature and like you know, depending on who we've had on the show, Brad, and you're one of our many guests that like kind of depends on your opinion. I was livid about uh, some of the offensive play calling and how people are blaming Shane Waldron for speed options or fullback dives to Doug Kramer. I'm sorry if you're a head coach with any merit, any sauce in your body, you hear that play call and you go, what the fuck are you talking about? Time out. Like, that's not what we're talking. That's not what we've discussed. You do have a certain amount of allowance as Shane Waldron based on what you discussed with Matt Eberflus. And if Matt Eberflus's job in terms of the offensive side of it is just to say, hey, Shane, I have full trust in you, that's a problem too. Yeah, and we talked about this, David. We talked about this during the offseason. Now we're going to need Shane Waldron to come in here and be the hero of the day. Because at the end of the day, like, okay, so Ben Johnson wants to call plays, and we've seen the whole thing where, like, you're too much of an offensive coordinator and not a head coach. However, the defense is a lot easier to figure out. You still had Vic Fangio here, right? We have a defensive coordinator as a head coach, and it feels like he's got no input on the offense. And we saw that based off the offense changing from Getsy to Waldron. And it, it is like, I trust you completely. And in that case, like, what are we doing? You've been in football your whole life. You have these guys out there that are special teams coaches that come in. Why? Because they have an established philosophy on defense and on offense. And they're just going to get guys to sit there and run their philosophy, run their plays. Eber Flus doesn't have it. But part of that problem, too, is that Matt Eberflus this summer was just so excited to talk about how much input he's going to have in the offensive room and helping Caleb Williams and how much he's going to teach him about offense by teaching him about defense and this and that. And that's he actually came out and that was one of his like big summertime talking points. He said hair and offensive involvement. Right. And then but this is what comes out of it is these two offenses that look extraordinarily similar right like two totally different play callers two totally different systems but we have two guys running the same route to the same part of the field how that fucking happens with two different guys with two different philosophies is beyond me it has to devolve or be part of that chunk of the percentage of blame to Matt Eberflus when he goes over the tape because he goes over the tape for two straight days he needs to go what the fuck was this Shane this is not acceptable. I should never see this route or this play ever again. Brad, I don't but want to keep talking gonna, over you. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, no yeah. worries. I was just going to say, like, I think exactly what you're talking about, Dave, where the whole self-scouting, 
where you need to be able to be on the defensive side and look because the Patriots were saying we saw the tells our defensive staff said that the Bears are going to do this the Bears are going to do that and there's times like I, I'm going to review the all 22 tape right after this and like when we go through it there's so many different plays that you just go oh they're probably going to do this right they always do the, the corner to the they always do a corner followed by another little out route right there they consistently do stuff like that and it's it's predictable but also there's a fine line between crazy and genius right it, it depends on what someone's perception is of you and shane waldron loves to be this mad scientist of play development like he likes to create these weird designs and to some people it's that's a genius move but right now everyone in the bears locker room is going nah you're just crazy right now coming up with these different designs and if they're not bought in then that's where it's you know you're not this genius of an innovator now now you're this crazy person coming up with all these insane weird plays that just people don't want it to work so it just uh, simply doesn't work but i think brad kind of like he literally mid-sentence i had this epiphanal moment of like why does not only this offense not work it's why are all the players so demotivated running routes? Because, and I saw this on Twitter yesterday too, where there's no purpose behind his play calling. There's none. There's no identity to it. That's a given, but there's no purpose behind it. We're not setting something up to set the next thing up. We're not doing something to create something else. It's just literally, I think it's like he hit like Madden shoes, flipped through a few pages and just said, fuck it. Let's run that one. Yeah. There's and still that's no what identity. happens where, and that's what happens when a player is just going like this fucking play again. I'm going to run this shit half ass because I know it's not coming to me. And I or I know that it's not going to matter because this is a stupid fucking play and I'm about to run a stupid fucking route. Guys, I want to. Yep. Go ahead, Brad. Yeah. Oh, I was say um, the one of the things, you know, when you talk about developing and like having that entire play call. Right. We know that the Bears wanted to run the uh, run the ball. Right. We also had the lowest amount of play action out of any team last week. So the whole thing of like developing the run and then running a play action, one could say, well, yeah, they have some blitzes, but if you're supposed to keep them honest and you're not even running a play action or anything like that, there's, there's that idea of that he doesn't set up his plays where even the week before he ran this one look and then the very next play ran the exact same look doing the actual end around and they just stopped the end around. They're like, Okay, um, that's something that you should have called later on in the game. And it's he doesn't understand the concept of the game management. It feels like it feels like he just wants to have his little Madden create a play, create that and be like, oh, this might be able to work. And when the blitz comes, there's no hot receiver. There's nothing like that that he can have because everyone's backs are turned because they're running deep routes on third and four when they're sending a blitz. Yeah, and so you know, it, it's, it's damning. I wanted to share this little video with you guys that we actually made last year. I forget exactly after which game it was, but um, Brad, I'm going to have to just take you off the screen. So it looks a little bit better, but guys check this video out. Players. It was a good call by the, by the, whoever this coordinator was. That was, that would be me. Did you, did you hear that? Well, let me just replay that really quickly. We just replaced a good call by the by the whoever this coordinator was that would that would be me and then... you stood up there all year and pointed a finger at the players on the execution in the beginning of the year I, I was with that I was saying yes the players need to execute better it seems like this guy uh, is happier about having a good week of practice than the result of a, a game and then to, to sit there and credit yourself like that I mean to whoever that coordinator was by the way that would be me. You, you got to be kidding yeah. me. When I, my jaw dropped, like, dude, you need to go. If you think that any of these players are going to play as hard as they did for you this last week after that coaching collapse at the end of that game, you, you're not going to get that kind of performance again all season from them. You're just not. And so, you know, we asked for accountability. There it was. Yep. Right? I'm accountable for that success.